I'm Wilson Lai. I'm Benjamin Yap. I'm Eli Sands. You're listening to Coupe Profond or Deep Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Nice. But y'all. <laughs> On Deep Cut, we compare a director's most popular film with a personal favorite chosen by one of us. We also discuss that director's life and career to bring in context that helps us view their movies as they may want us to. This episode, we're going to talk about my girlfriend's boyfriend. Wait, hold on. That's me. (laughs) We're talking Ben. (laughs) I hope it's me. (laughs) I'm kidding. But we're going to be talking about my favorite Romare film, which is also titled Boyfriends and Girlfriends. Or Hoes Before Bros. Bros before hoes. It goes both ways. <laughs> Alternate titles. <laughs> yeah, so this is Romero's 1987 film that is the last of the comedies and proverbs cycle. And we cover one of those, which is The Green Ray, in our first Romero episode. And this one is based on the proverb, the friends of my friends are my friends. And kind of similar to the rest of them, centers on a female protagonist. And in this case, the so-called lead character is Blanche, played by Emmanuel Cholet in her, I think, only Romare film, huh. which is rare because usually they appear a few times. She stars alongside Sophie Renoir, who plays Leia, who has been in A Good Marriage. And the two men I've not seen in other Romare films, and that's Alexandre and Fabienne. And then we have Anne-Laure Murray, who plays Adrienne, which you see in The Avia's Wife as the young 15-year-old. Looking very different in this film. <laughs> no. No, that's yes, her. That's no her. No way. <laughs> she looks oh, so different. I this think six it's years the after. hair. It's also the hair. Yes. It's a massive it's hair. hair change. Also, question. Does anyone know if Sophie Renoir is related to... The famed mm. director, Jean Renoir. And I have an answer for you because I searched it up. Which is? Yes, she is. No and way. She is the daughter of cinematographer Claude Renoir and the grand niece of renowned film director Jean Renoir. Hmm. Makes sense. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> the French film circle is probably smaller than we think. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's kind of all the context I have because I feel like this is the last of our Romare films, but I think this, if I were to recommend anyone watch a Romare film, this is the one. This is the most accessible one. This is the most fun one. This is the one you start with and then you're like, what else is there? This is the gateway to Romare. That's kind of it. <laughs> It's my favorite Romare film, and I just want to hear what both of you think. Eli, go. You just finished. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally just watched, and it was such an easy, peaceful, friendly movie. And one of the things that Ben has said to us off mic is that Romare movies are really good for discussing afterwards. And I find that it's incredibly enjoyable to watch in the moment. And then I know we're going to dig up so much stuff by talking through it. Oh, definitely. I don't know. I'm thinking about the costumes. I'm thinking about the location. I'm thinking about these long takes where people just get to be together on camera. I'm thinking about nature versus the suburb. There is a lot there, but it's also just kind of breezy and friendly. And it reminded me of Shakespearean romantic comedies Mm. in some way, because Things start off in a way that they shouldn't be for these characters, and they end up okay. And you sort of know that it's going there along the way. And it's enjoyable because there's that promise of a happy ending kind of inherent in the atmosphere of the movie. I enjoyed it. I <laughs> I love this movie so yes. much. <laughs> oh, you don't even know, man. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> watched this movie for the first time. Fuck, when did I watch it? Like a week ago? And then you watched it twice after. (laughs) (laughs) We are recording on August 11th, and I watched it for the first time on August 4th. And then on Letterboxd, I'm up to 1,999 films. So I was scared to log a 2,000. Weird flex, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's true, though. It's true. You can look on Letterboxd whenever this episode comes out. And then I I just didn't want to log a 2,000 film. So I was like, what better way to spend my movie watching time by watching this again? And then I had extra time today, and I was like, well, I could, like, nap. (laughs) Or I could just dive back in. And I love this film so much. I love how it makes me feel inside. It is around the end of summer. And this is sort of like me grasping on to the last 
images and ideas of summer that I can in my life. Out of all the Romare films we've seen, it is so light and airy, to quote the Green mm. Ray. <laughs> uh, I love <laughs> light and airy things. And it also has such a pure and beautiful friendship at the film's core. That's what the whole movie is birthed out of, is this mm. friendship that buds between Blanche and Leia. And I just think that's so beautiful. And yes. it is also the source of a lot of the conflict that develops through the film and the anxiety. But you know that the friendship is the most important part to them. And that's why mm. it's holding them back from the romantic pursuits. I actually don't agree with that. <laughs> okay, before Eli goes into this summary, what, what is this film about? This film was about Blanche and Leah. They become friends and then... They somehow get embroiled in a confusing love quadrangle and <laughs> love quadrilateral, baby. <laughs> and are like into each other's boyfriends slash love interests. And they're not sure what to do about that. And it's a very light screwball romantic farce, if I could really classify it as anything. Yes. And there's some windsurfing in it for some reason. Really makes me want to windsurf. <laughs> oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> I have windsurfed. It's very hard, uh, but it yeah. looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to say, Eli? What was I? What was your take, Wilson? <laughs> I was talking about how the friendship was the core and how... Oh, I think this movie shows a friendship that matters between Blanche and Leia and that sort of falls by the wayside as they have romantic pursuits. But it doesn't portray that fading of a friendship as something wrong. It's very natural and kind of positive and they both end up where they need to be because of this friendship. But... I think the movie lets friendships and relationships change as they do in real life in a way that feels natural and organic. I don't think that's disagreeing with me. <laughs> but I don't think by the end, the friendship is the most important thing to them. I think I see them parting ways a little bit to be with their new boyfriends. I think I beg to differ because of that mm. final interaction, yeah. which I guess we can start there. Let's start with the ending because... This movie is made by its ending. Yeah. yeah. Classic <laughs> ending. What happens at the end? So Blanche is interested in a guy. Leah has a boyfriend. But then at the end of this film, Blanche gets together with Leah's ex-boyfriend. And then Leah gets together with the guy that Blanche was having a crush on, which is a very symmetrically perfect kind of situation. Yeah. yeah. Coupled by a very symmetrically perfect final few frames where the wardrobe of these two couples is completely complemented where the women are wearing blue and green and then the men are wearing green and blue kind of it's hard to explain just look at a poster <laughs> <laughs> it'll make sense that final conversation i thought was so sweet and i do agree that it kind of betrays a little bit of Romero's more conservative side, which is that he kind of sees men and women falling into relationships and then kind of going on their lives and I think Romare is part of the reason why in cinema people think of romantic engagements, not in terms of the ring, but rather romantic couplings as a sort of ending mm. where you want to get together with somebody and that's how things end and then happily ever after. Romare is part of that and I think he's conservative in that sense that he believes a lot in the union between men and women. Not necessarily in marriage, but like in relationships. Right. Yeah. That they're supposed to get together as romantic couples. But still, I think at the end, there's a strong affirmation of the female friendship at the center between Blanche and Leah and the way that they both have a boy now and then are also still really good friends. And I think there's something really beautiful and cute about that. I agree with that. I think they have also changed and maybe aren't the same type of close friends that they were at the top of the movie. And that's perfectly okay. Or are they close friends enough, like, when they see it's, like, a good match? They're like, I'll let you have it. <laughs> yeah, they're happy for each other. Yeah. This last scene is just incredible. It's so good. Where the two women accidentally decide to meet their men in the same outdoor cafe and then start revealing to each other the thing that they've been <laughs> keeping secret, but then realizing they're talking about the wrong person. <laughs> my favorite moment is when they realize and they're like laughing about it and then there's a silence and Leah's face is like wait a minute you slept with my boyfriend <laughs> yeah. but then after she's like she's chill she's no, like whatever right after, right she, after says, she I got questions my revenge. her she says yeah she says I got my revenge yeah <laughs> yeah which is hilarious and 
Agno also sweet. And like they're like, oh, it's okay. Yeah. There's a very weirdly light and breezy quality to the deceit in this movie. Yeah. In the central infidelity where Fabian, which is Leah's boyfriend at the time, sleeps with Blanche, Leah's best friend, which should be a huge crushing thing that happens in another movie. But in here, it is thought of as a huge crushing thing, but ends up becoming a sort of whimper at the end. It's France. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I, I think even in a French movie, there's more import to something like this. And this one, the significance is all imagined and mm-hmm. all part of Blanche's anxious mind. But then in Fidelity, in a different Romare movie, which we've already discussed, Love in the Afternoon, is treated with a lot more weight. I You're thought right. that was an interesting comparison point. I do think that boyfriends and girlfriends is very much on the side of, like, young people in love versus love in the afternoon being, like, I don't know, you're, you've are you been That's on true. this track for a long time. And I think what's beautiful about... Yeah, babies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What's beautiful about boyfriends and girlfriends is the idea that when you're young, love is fun, love is fleeting. It is the time to, like, play around with love like this. And hmm. I think all four of these main characters have similar approaches to the way they treat love. They're supposed to be enjoying themselves and they shouldn't get down on themselves that hard. And I think that is what Blanche and Leah both come to realize by the end of the film is like, oh, yeah, like, why not? They learn the distinction between what they feel they should want versus what they actually want yes yes i was writing some notes so this film is on my best friend cinema canon list great list and it's the film that made me make it this film made me realize that i love films about best friends just hanging out and having good time and then also like (laughs) arguing a little bit and this one is basically that and i love that in my initial review and on my initial watch the thing that i took away the most from this film is that the meet cute is between the two women becoming best friends and then talking about swimming which is very random (laughs) (laughs) and then just become friends and then immediately they're just best friends and i love that about this and that friendship is so strong but then i also realized that in terms of romantic movies this is kind of he's the one slash she's the one cinema where somebody is with somebody and then the audience is constantly telling them no you should be with that guy (laughs) like that's the vibe of this film and it's exactly that where You're thinking Blanche should be with Fabien, and it's so obvious, but then they're resisting it. And you know Leah should be with Alexandre, but she's resisting it, and you're like, why are you resisting this? How early do you think that you were clued into the Blanche-Fabien pairing? Because for me, it was pretty late. Like, what, when they kiss? I was like, what are you thinking? No, it was like like only when Leah has that important scene where she is about to leave to go on her week off at her grandparents and she gives Blanche the Roland Garros tickets and says like, oh, who knows? Maybe if he's available oh, yeah. and you're available. And I'm <laughs> she like, makes oh, fun of it. Okay, Leia. <laughs> well, she makes fun of it and then she laughs and then she says it again more seriously, mm-hmm. like a line after. And I'm like, no, she actually genuinely means it. Like, if she's broken up with him, she's yeah. Like, yeah, fuck my boyfriend, yeah. You can take him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. I, I didn't know that that was an idea that we're, we're, we're thinking about. But yeah, thank you, Leia. I think the first time I saw this, I wasn't sure where it was going. I was like, okay. Like, what's going on? Like, we're just hanging out for a while? <laughs> we're going windsurfing? All right. <laughs> but there are so many clever little ways that Romare puts that desire in you to see Fabienne and Blanche together. He's using coincidence super well, like when (sighs) Blanche and Fabienne run into each other. And yeah, in the ending, when they end up at the same restaurant, he's using these things to nudge you towards what you really want to see because he's planted that desire in you very quietly. It's sneakily a super well-written movie. And again, it reminds me of things like Shakespearean romantic comedies Mm. because the desire to see two people end up together who you have a feeling will be good together is such a strong propulsive force Mm. through a narrative that it allows him to use coincidences and things that in other movies might make us go, huh, okay. That's true. And also, this is neither here nor there, but when Blanche starts to follow Fabienne and Alexandre in in the (laughs) shopping center... (laughs) 
<laughs> oh yeah i was like oh are fabian and alexandra gonna kiss like <laughs> is that what's about to happen who knows okay wait this is my dream that i think there should be a queer reimagining of this where like there everybody just kisses everyone because yeah. there's so many moments where you're just like okay maybe now the lady should kiss or like maybe now the men should kiss <laughs> like when they were at the table at the ending i thought that blanche and leo were gonna kiss <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean they well, kind they of did. do they did they sort of they did, did but like I, it was like oh 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 okay <laughs> all right well <laughs> But if you're into that and also into reality TV, are you the one oh season eight <laughs> has an all like bi or pansexual cast wow. and it is usually a straight dating show, but now it's just a free for all. So everyone's just wow. like, having sex with each other and it's <laughs> wild. Surprise, um, you're actually all supposed to end up with all of each other. <laughs> yeah. There are no individual pairings. You're all the one. Yeah. You're all just one being sexually. <laughs> like a jellyfish. But yes, wishing for the queer remake of this. But <laughs> you're right, Eli, that the desire for people to get together is why the ending is so satisfying. Like the most yeah. satisfying Romero yeah. ending because it really it's one is. with so much conclusive power compared to most of his other films where... It's not really tragic. It's not really open-ended necessarily. It's just like, you know what? Everyone gets to be happy and yeah. it's awesome. <laughs> There's real optimism and delight in yes. the whole movie and especially that ending. It's a work of magic. After you mentioned when she follows Fabienne Alexandre, that's like one of my favorite scenes <laughs> because <laughs> that's a scene where Blanche sneakily follows the two of them who are just like hanging out and then engineers a situation where she <laughs> runs into them so that she can talk to Alexan and then completely flubs an opportunity to spend one-on-one -on -one time with Alexan <laughs> and then after that goes home and cries about it and I was like Aww. girl I feel you oh that <laughs> crying scene that crying scene is so good like out of yes. all the sad girls crying in Romero films <laughs> this is the best scene it's so good because you see her slowly enter her really sad apartment complex white apartment <laughs> like <laughs> oh they're still like putting in all the grass outside on the field yeah. behind her but it's still just soil so it's just like a block of gray on frame yeah and you just see her walking in and then you see her walking into the apartment in the next shot and the following shot is through the mirror of her bathroom and then she appears like she's already crying and she Aww. looks at herself in the mirror and she's like get it together and i'm like i feel you <laughs> so much i love blanche because like she's so anxious and you just like blanche you can find love then that's just kind of how you feel for her you're just like you know you'll find love somewhere everyone chill and he's right there except it's your girlfriend's boyfriend i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> when she sets out to follow Fabienne and Alexandre, there's a really great shot where she steps out of the store from which she spots them and she looks and then we see what she's looking at, which is Fabienne and Alexandre walking off. And I thought to myself, I don't know which one she's looking at. And the point, of course, is that mm -hmm. she is interested in both men at this point. Mm -hmm. But it turns from a POV shot into one where she walks into the frame. I don't necessarily have a point about that, but it's just a clever, calm low-key little way to switch up the rhythm and keep you on your toes. I think the way that Romer covers scenes in this is really interesting. And I think this film is the one that gives you an idea of what he's doing because he doesn't really have one mode of covering his talky scenes. No. Some films he has more long takes and in some films he uses shot reverse shot. And you see that in Green Ray, Love in the Afternoon. Here he kind of has a nice balance of both, which always keeps you on the toes. The scene I remember the most in terms of this is when Fabienne and Blanche are walking on some kind of little pier kind of thing. Yes. And mm -hmm. it, it constantly moves between a shot reverse shot thing or yeah. a medium long shot where it's like cut above the knees to the head, which is pretty wide and then runs long. And then he moves between a longer holding on the wide shot versus shot reverse shot. And that really keeps these conversations moving. And then because the blocking is dynamic, it makes the conversations feel really lived in and real, but also not boring. Yeah. He's not staging conversations, you know, two people sitting down across from each other, shot, reverse shot all the time. Although sometimes he does that. Or sometimes it's a two shot where they're sitting next to each other. So he's constantly playing with the blocking that makes things interesting and light and airy. Right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he also uses a lot of zooms in this, which I really yeah. love to like really segment, out, segment out tableau blocking. 
where they're sitting next to each other. So one of the biggest examples of that is when one of the first times that Blanche and Fabienne are hanging out together and they're having, I think, a barbecue or a meal outside in the garden with Leia and how the the camera is like at a three shot and then sort of zooms in to cut Blanche out when Leia and Fabienne are like talking to each other. And then when Leia starts bringing up this girl that's interested in Alexandra, it starts zooming out back into a three shot and then zooming in on a single of Blanche. And I'm like, that's so economical, but so effective. And I think this is like one of the direct things that Hong sang Su just took out of the Romero playbook <laughs> and just really made it his whole visual style. And, um, he's much less subtle about it. Oh, definitely <laughs> zooms less are just subtle like, about it. <laughs> like I can hear the zoom lens moving when he does it. <laughs> you know that kind of feel when Hong does it. And then here it's just like you know there's something yeah. to motivate it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Hong <laughs> really makes it his own. <laughs> that zoom that you bring up, especially the first one that goes in on Leia and Fabienne, also just raises the stakes because it subtly makes you believe that they could end up together as a couple. Yeah. It is the camera highlighting the two of them and their union and space. Yeah. Uh, And then, of course, it backtracks from that. It's so beautiful because the the script is already, like, playing with this relationship dynamic. And then the the camera is just there to, like, back it up in a really Mm. showy way. Yeah. That scene I was talking about where they're walking along that pier thing and talking... The way it ends is that it goes to shot reverse shot between Blanche and Fabienne. But I think it ends on this shot, if I'm not wrong, of Fabienne, then zooms out to include Blanche, and then they walk off together. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, there is a push and pull between them, and then suddenly at the end, it's like, let me join the two ways of covering the scene and put my characters together as they leave. And so there's a very strong suggestion that these two should be together. You know what? I have a hot take. Ready? Yes. Hot take. Ready. Go for it. There's no score in this movie. I think that the camera blocking and camera movement and editing act as a score that are Mm. telling us things that a score might in other movies, suggesting where people work well together and where people might break their union. And we right now in this conversation are picking up on feelings from the camera movement that a score might tell us in a different mm. movie. Mm. It is musical camera movement. I think he plays it very well because like, you also have not just camera movement, but the way that things are cut. Yeah. yeah. Like we talk about like, the double chance meeting between Blanche and Fabienne, and it's covered so simply, and it's just <sighs> it a bunch is. of wide shots. It shoots down these corridors, but then it's just kind of like, here is him, here is her, here is him, here is her, and it's just kind of bouncing between them as they meet each other. So there's like a playful rhythmic quality to the way that they meet up Mm. like this film isn't something that's necessarily following one character too closely because it cuts around shows you all the characters doing different things although it follows blanche the most but then when it kind of pulls out in a scene like this it's kind of like you are not say omniscient but almost like this bystander who has a good view of everyone and are able to pick out all of them and you see the rhythm of coincidence and chance and fate within the Romero world and the Mm. rhythm of the editing Mm. really builds into that another thing that Romero does to keep scenes dynamic is that he will often plant a subtle little action in the dialogue scene so that for example Blanche's wetsuit the zipper gets stuck that's something that both gives a process to the scene something that needs to be accomplished it brings them closer together physically and it spawns new conversation between the two of them. Mm -hmm. It's such an efficient choice that does so much. He finds a lot of charm and humor in extremely mundane shit sometimes. And I love that. Same. And how everyone is able to, like, launch into a story that reflects back on their character, which will, I guess, lead into, I guess, more attraction or less attraction in some cases. (laughs) I think it's such a well plotted out and well structured film in its script even if you look at like the first scene when they first meet up and then it's just this chance meeting and they start talking about how they hate eating alone both of them yeah and then that just starts them off talking about themselves and then they kind of start vibing and then they walk off together after lunch and they just start talking about swimming and then they become friends so it's well plotted but 
because it's based on such mundane stuff, you don't really feel like it's plotted because it feels so relatable all the mm-hmm. time. Even though my life is not like a French girl's, I feel like it <laughs> relates to me <laughs> somehow because I feel like, yeah, I could have this conversation wearing a very big jacket. I could. Yeah. <laughs> also, I love a big jackets. Uh, I see a lot of people shitting on the 80s fashion in comedies and proverbs, and I do not understand. Bring everything back. <laughs> nah, I wish I dressed like that every day of my life. Also, it really helps that this time around, everyone's good looking. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would talk about I'm that. <laughs> very, very, very pleased. And I think that was the biggest difference, which makes this a five star movie and Love in the Afternoon a four star movie. Fair. Is... <laughs> Cinema is a visual medium. <laughs> it is. And if there's nothing to appreciate on the screen, how am I going to enjoy this movie? <laughs> I made one tiny observation this time which I think is possibly something that was thought about, which is that Fabienne and Blanche have blue-green eyes, and Leia and Alexandre have brown eyes. Whoa. Of course they do. <laughs> of course they do. And there's a lot of that blue-green colors going on, which also match mm-hmm. up with the windsurfing area. Yeah. And really complement that final scene so well, mm-hmm. where that two-shot of Blanche and Leia has this incredible background of the water and the trees. That's also blue and green as the both of them are in blue and green. And I've noticed that a lot of Romero films tend to shoot trying to get rid of the sky. Right. And I'm not sure if that's necessarily always the case, but I feel like I see it a lot because he tends to put the camera kind of at head height. And so it sometimes points downwards towards the characters. And then that kind of brings the ground up in the frame, Mm -hmm. whether it's trees or the ground itself, or like when he puts them on a hill, then the hill rises up behind them. So he tends to cut sky and put nature and buildings in the background, which I think is interesting because it's almost like a postcard background. It's gorgeous. While we are on location, partway through the movie, I just started wondering where was this filmed? Mm -hmm. Because the way that he's using the town specifically and nature is very purposeful and it's doing a lot. It's funneling these characters towards each other. It's visually breaking them up using things like columns in the Mm -hmm. shopping center. So I found that the name of the town where it was filmed is Sergi. Oh, (laughs) here we go. And it's what's called a Ville Nouvelle, which is a new town. Mm. Oh, a Denis Ville Nouvelle. Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) These were suburbs that were built near Paris, sprawling out, and they had large influxes of young people and Mm. new families moving to them, especially in the 80s, which is when this is filmed. It was the steepest incline of immigration to these towns from the cities and the smaller villages. But Romare had an interest in these new towns. He made a short documentary series in 1975 about these new towns, and he did one on Sergi Pontois, which is the setting for Boyfriends and Girlfriends 12 years afterwards. Wow, no way. Nice research. So he already had an interest and he had a familiarity with the town and he used it. What I get from the use of the town, along with something like Blanche's costume changes from these professional outfits that don't quite fit her towards more casual clothing as she is pairing up with Fabienne, there's a lot of posturing of these young people to be young professionals in this Mm. shiny new town that doesn't quite feel lived in, Mm. in many spaces. Blanche's apartment, the shopping center, it's all very pristine, either white walls or new brick. And it goes in conjunction with what I said earlier about these characters are doing what they feel like they should want rather than what they genuinely want. And so when they move closer to what they actually want, they move out of the city, out of these stodgy professional clothes that, by the way, are Still cool. I like those outfits, too. <laughs> Eli wants to say on the record that he likes the clothes in these movies, this movie. Yeah. Alexandra looks great in that suit. And they move towards the countryside, towards the water, and into more comfortable clothing because they're moving towards what they genuinely want for themselves. Yes. Not an idea of what they should want. They want to win, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> You're making me think about how this feels like The Sims when you talk about new towns. Like, it's like an empty slate kind of thing where young people are trying to figure out their lives. And I think 
he's kind of playing with them. I mean, Romero's pretty old at this point, mm-hmm. talking about making a movie about 20-something people, which is pretty interesting. He's almost like, not playing God, but like <laughs> kind of playing with the idea and like using young people as almost dolls and putting it in weird romantic situations. Mm. <laughs> but he has a very keen and sharp sense of the kind of people they are. I'm always struck by Romero's attention to people's occupations. Mm. The opening of this film is the credits and the credit sequence shows all of them doing work in their individual workspaces. And except for Blanche, we never go back to those workplaces for Fabien, Alexandre, and Leia, which is interesting, but he always uses occupations to kind of shade in an aspect of a character. And in this one, people talk about work. They talk about what work suits them and the kind of work they should be doing. And I think that's very interesting. And I think that's also something that possibly helps this also become more relatable to people Mm. watching this at the time where they're like, yeah, I work at Power and Light or yeah, I'm a bureaucrat. And it roots it in some kind of reality. So they're not just people that are part of a story that the director Mm. made up. They feel like real people. And the other thing about this film that I love is that compared to a lot of other Romero films, which are very constructed and tightly plotted, which this is, this one chooses to have so many scenes in public. Mm. probably shot run and gun in a sense Mm. which are echoes from the green ray where they have all these you know scenes in these tourist spots with real tourists running around right here you have bustling city centers shopping centers and the windsurfing place lake where people are also just doing their thing you have cutaways to real people just hanging out at the park and the lake and it really feels like a real place because it is and I like the vibe that that gives. Like, the real world gives this film, compared to other Romero films, more life. Even though it's so constructed, it feels real. Yeah, I really felt that with this one. And conversely, we've all seen rom-coms which don't have a strong sense of place and don't mm. have a strong sense of characters actually living life outside the boundaries of the movie. And we get to the end of the movie, and I know I think, well, wait, who are you? Mm. Like, what do you do? Mm. And it matters. It's like the characters are just existing for the relationship for the movie. You really need that feeling of real life to make people feel relatable and then to be invested in the romantic yes. stuff that they're entangled in. Mm-hmm. I think a little bit about Linklater's Before trilogy. And it's been a long time since I've seen those. And I think Before Sunrise of the Three feels the least real because he sets it in a tourist town. And then there's no kind of things for them to relate to Mm -hmm. in that town that they're in that they're not from because their characters are not from there. So they're just in alien places talking about lofty concepts and stuff. Right. So then they feel quite written. Mm -hmm. But then when you go into Before Sunset and Midnight, there's more context that's built in through the years, right? Where Before Sunset, the sense of the fact that Ethan Hawke's character is a writer kind of sets in. Mm -hmm. And then with Midnight, the fact that they're a married couple sets in and the fact that they're friends sets in. And those elements help make those feel a bit more lived in and real. So yeah, I don't know. I think that's an interesting touchstone with Linklater using so much of Romero as an influence Mm. that you can kind of see where he is weaker than Romero in some sense, Yeah, at least early on, but then kind of figures out what he needs to make his films better. I want to talk about the scene where they finally get together in the middle of the woods and this sort of push and pull back and forth i'm gonna kiss you no i'm not and then fabienne says this beautiful line about his dream about like he goes into the woods and this other girl that he doesn't know goes into the woods and then they like make love and then they they part ways still anonymous to each other and then while he's saying this it cuts away from the two shot of them to just a slow panning shot of the woods around them Mm. and i was like i'm so sold right now i'm so sold like you (laughs) have to go for it blanche like now's the time (laughs) and then she does go for it she says i didn't think this is a guy's dream but more a girl's dream and then they start (laughs) making out and i'm like yes this is like one of the best scenes ever (laughs) it's just so beautiful because even earlier in the scene they get to the clearing in the woods and blanche is looking around and she starts crying and this is just crying yeah (laughs) i love it and then that is what i guess gives fabian the chance to like embrace her and Mm. i just really feel blanche in that moment and her straining so hard to like make this 
decision that Mm -hmm. is like, what do I choose right now? Like, I'm so in love, but I also am thinking about my best friend at the same Mm. time. What an incredible scene. Man, the acting of this is really great because everyone's just exactly perfectly cast. Yeah. Like, the nerviness of Blanche is so palpable that you can feel her palms sweating. Yeah. (laughs) And, like, when she's talking to Alexandre and also when she's talking to Fabian, when she's like, damn, I like this guy, but what do I do now? And, like, when she, like, fidgets the flower in the one of the previous scenes, like, she has so much, like, nervy energy coming out of her <laughs> that makes her really endearing. <laughs> yeah. And I love that at the start in the scene you're talking about where Fabian embraces her and then they pull apart and they come together again. The blocking of that feels so well thought out. It kind of teases you. They're like, they're going to start kissing. No, they're going to stop. And then, okay, no, they're going to do it. And then next scene, they had sex. Yeah. And... Yeah, I also thought it was kind of cute when Fabian goes like, can I? Before he kisses her. Yeah. And then she's like, okay. (laughs) And then it's like kind of cute that he asked for consent. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm just super swooning for this movie. The whole (laughs) runtime, I'm just like have a big grin on my face. I'm like, fully. The first time I watched it, I was like, no way. There's always this like feeling of anticipation. Yeah. And then like, something good happens and then like yeah. they pull it back a little bit and then only at the very end does it like give you everything yeah oh. yeah it's like that meme at the end you know where it's like that the guy's like texting and it's like to god and he's like when <laughs> question mark i'm like that's what? how i feel wait no, <laughs> i've so it's never just... seen this meme <laughs> what is this meme it's like a screenshot of a text and the text is to god and the message is when like when will this happen to me <laughs> Never mind, some listeners will get it. <laughs> it's because y'all are paired up, so it doesn't concern okay, you. Okay, <laughs> okay. While we're on acting, Alexandra Appreciation Hour. <laughs> yeah. Dude is charming. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even charming. when he's being very, very forward, you're like, damn, but he can do it. Yeah. Like when he starts flirting with Leah at the end, you're just like, damn. And Leah's yeah. like into it, but she's like, no, but she's into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love the montage of Leia and Alexander <sighs> falling in love. So beautiful. Which is just crazy because you have this longer narrative in terms mm-hmm. of movie time of Blanche and Fabian falling in love. Both of them are more neurotic and anxious people. Yes. And then they try to figure shit out and then they get together. <laughs> then you have Leia and Alexander who are like, they're just total chillers and very sure of themselves. Yes. And the moment they decide they want to get together, it's like, bam, we're in love. Yeah. Let's sleep together. Let's stay together for six days or something. That's like in the last 10 minutes of the movie before the last scene. <laughs> yeah. I was checking the runtime of the movie when Alexandra and Leia have that conversation where he tries to get her to come with him on his trip or tries to get her to move in with him. A lot of different things, just tries to get with her. And I was checking, and I was like, wait, there are like 15 minutes left in this movie. Yeah. And in that 15 minutes, Romare ties up everything with Blanche and Fabienne, but also at the same time constructs this whole romance between Leia and Alexandra that is so believable. It's so convincing. Exactly. In that six or seven setups, right? Right. Like different kinds of scenes. And at the end, you sort of treat both couples equally. Like you have mm. equal affection towards both of them. And I'm like, okay, so this is where this is an example of fast track storytelling <laughs> and an example of slow track storytelling all together in one film. This movie is exactly what it needs to be when it needs to be. And I want to like do a scene breakdown or something because just the way it rises and falls is so expertly concocted. It yeah. feels so natural. Lightning in the bottle right there. Lightning <laughs> in the bottle. <laughs> this film has so many like tiny acting moments that I really like that are like blink and you miss it type things because they usually mm. happen in wider shots. One of those is after Fabienne and Blanche hook up, and then they go to the party with Leia. And then Leia and Fabian are there. And then Blanche walks in, probably feeling very weird about everything. <laughs> and when she walks in, Fabian's face is just like... <laughs> <laughs> he has like a smirk going on. And then he's he knows Blanche is still into him, but not sure what to do about it. And like, it's in hindsight, probably a bit weird. But then like, in the moment, you're like, this is kind of funny and fun. And <laughs> I love that. And then another moment I like, which is like, One of my all-time favorite things in films is when filmmakers 
choose not to show you stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm. And there's this scene when Leia comes back, <sighs> which is the scene right uh. after Fabienne and Blanche hook up. <laughs> and Leia comes in and you're like, oh, fuck, what's going to happen? Is Blanche going to out herself and talk about the sex that she just had? Or is she going to hide it well? And then she has this little nook where she has her drinks. Yeah. And the moment that Leia tells her, oh, me and Fabian are back together, is when you cannot see Blanche You at don't all. see her face. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, fuck, what is she thinking? What is she thinking? And then she comes out and you're like, oh, shit, what you going to do? This is a bad situation. <laughs> that moment also aligns with what's happening in the dialogue, too, because Leia's talking about, it seems like you've changed. I disappear for a week <laughs> and I get back and I feel like everyone's changed. And Romero is literally hiding Blanche from view in that moment. Another example of holding back information, I guess specifically from Leah, is when she comes back later on, like a, like, a, like 20 minutes later in the rum time, and tells Blanche that she broke up with, with Fabian. And that happens off screen. And then Alexandra quickly joins them. And mm. you just see just on Blanche's face, because she doesn't say much throughout the scene. The point of the scene is to show how disconnected that she is from right. Leia and Alexandra. But it's so clearly played out in her face. It, it is the slow realization that A, Alexandra has no interest in me, and B, Fabienne is actually the one that I'm thinking about. Mm. And then you see it come to a boiling point in her emotions, and then she leaves. That's perfect. What I like about that scene is also the play of like what you know as an audience member and also what the characters don't know. Mm. Because there's something really fun about watching stuff like that. When Blanche leaves and then Leia reveals at least what she thinks is the truth, which is that she reveals to Alexander that the reason she left is because she has cold feet about him. And then he quite brutally says, I'm absolutely not interested in this lady. <laughs> <laughs> very, very <laughs> flippantly. And Leah's like telling him that Blanche is so into Alexander. But you know that when you're watching this, that the reason she leaves is she's probably also thinking about Fabian. It's not really about Alexander at the time. It's actually more about Fabian. And then when she goes back and sees the letter from Fabian, she's so happy about it. Because she, at that point, kind of figures out that he's the man for her rather than mm. Alexandre. Mm. I like that at the ending, it's Leia and Blanche who know what's happened, but the men are just like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really funny moment when Fabian comes along and then sees Alexandre hiding. <laughs> from the two women and, and then they he, just he go gives a little wave yeah. <laughs> they're constantly shaking hands yeah I love that the men are just kind of like the romantic objects in this and then they're just kind of they're kind of dumb in the sense that they don't know the drama they're just part of it right yeah. <laughs> they're just like yeah I'm just trying to get laid and get a girlfriend but some shit's going down and I don't get it <laughs> <laughs> and then the women are just like oh fuck <laughs> my best friend her feelings <laughs> <laughs> and the men like, have zero concept. They're just kind of stupid about it. <laughs> <laughs> have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Adrienne is interesting. She's a little mean. Yeah. Oh, but I love, I love that. I love that. We need a little bit of that. She's like the mean friend in Green Ray. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like she gives the real talk, right? She's just like, <laughs> like cut the crap. Does he give a shit? <laughs> I love the blocking in that scene where Adrienne is talking to Blanche earlier on Oh, and she keeps on, on walking away, and she keeps on following her. And yeah, Blanche keeps on walking walk. away. Here's another great example, though, of blocking that if it were just held in one wide, it wouldn't necessarily feel natural. But Romare does the right amount of panning to follow Blanche walking away and Adrienne catching up and cutting to a new angle to keep up with the two of them. Yeah, It's such a delicate balance between blocking without cutting and cutting to situate around new blocking so that it all feels natural. Romare and his editor, Maria Luisa Garcia, are just such a good pairing. Match made in heaven. Wait, Eli, now you need to watch The Aviator's Wife. This is, <laughs> okay. like, still fucking with me. Like, I, like, still, like, <laughs> am so shocked by this fact that she was the lead <laughs> girl in Aviator's Wife. Yeah, I, I do not see the resemblance at all. It's kind of confusing. <laughs> and between the two films, it's, like, six years. So in that film, she's 15. Yeah. Here she's, like, 21, 20, but she looks 21. like she's 30. Yeah. Like it's wow. kind of strange. Like it she aged so wild. fast. Like what the, what's going on? She has so what I would call a not great haircut in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> if anything should be left in the 80s is that haircut right Ooh, <laughs> rough and here i am like looking at fabian's hair and i'm like doing this while i'm watching I'm like how do i do this how do i have this little poof in front of my hair that's all i got about this movie i don't know if y'all have anything else Just love it it's nice it's great it's kind of masterful in a very quiet way it's just kind of a good time yeah, and yeah. you love it for what it is it's really just a film you watch. You just kind of you just live yeah. in it for a little bit, and you love that experience. Mm. It's not trying to be exceptionally flashy, and Romero is never trying to be exceptionally flashy. And what I find kind of interesting now that I'm talking about this is that a lot of filmmaking is about using film tricks to make you interested in the story. When you talk about say close-ups to get you closer to a person, or using cutting to get you invested, or to make you feel the intensity of a situation or using flashy camera moves to do that. But here, he's doing the bare minimum. But the thing that works the hardest is the characters that he concocts and the situations mm -hmm. he concocts. And they are the thing that makes you want to watch it. Yeah. And then he doesn't have to try very hard to make you invest it. And I don't know, maybe other filmmakers should try and invest more time in that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do, they do. And those are the filmmakers that were inspired by Romare. That's true. At this point, we've really covered a range of types of directors on that spectrum. On the more overt formalist stylist mm -hmm. and are people like Rogue and Lynn Ramsey yeah. and Varda to a certain extent. And we've also talked about Coriada and Wiseman, mm -hmm. and now Romare, who are deliberately removing those tools from the toolbox. And in a way, there's more of a direct entry into characters without working quite as hard. Though, of course, no one way is better than another. And mm -hmm. every director that we've talked about, I think, uses the things in their toolkit to great advantage. And Obviously, because that's why we're talking about them. I'm very biased because I just love vibey directors. <laughs> but actually, yeah. I don't know. Like, sometimes I find that certain vibey directors are like more than others. I'm not sure why Romero is so much more resonant than some other directors. And it's really hard to pinpoint because I think this kind of more low-key directorial style, you need a very stealthy directorial hand to make it work. Yeah, mm. And I think we mentioned in our Corey Ada episode where like he is very good at that, stealthily introducing plot and giving you characters to align with. And Romare 2 is very good at that Yeah, without using too many cinematic tools. And he's able to lull you in and lure you in and make you feel invested in characters. Yeah, I think as a person who just likes looking at people, I think that's kind of why I usually fall in love with this kind of filmmaking very hard when I do, because it feels like people watching, but you're given a very, very good front row seat. Right. It's almost like a movie you watch and you're gossiping about fake people. <laughs> I feel like I've said this before about some other movie, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for introducing me to Romer, Ben. I'm really excited to watch more. Just like it's a director with whom it's an instant click for me nice me too i love that both of you have fallen in love with romero as much <laughs> as i have i sort of wish that this was not the last episode but it is a good one to go mm. out on hey we can always return to more if there's popular demand for it cast your <laughs> vote this november for romero <laughs> we just talked about his period pieces which i still haven't seen by the way <laughs> <laughs> this is a slice of romero but it's like missing a big chunk which is the period pieces i have no knowledge of yet oh my recommendations for, if you like this one, yes. watch Four Adventures of Renette and Miverbell. That's one that's purely best friend cinema because <laughs> there are no men that are important in that one. Incredible. That was just two girls hanging out and they might be gay, but Romero's not going there. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Oh, God, I wish. I wish he was still alive, man. I wonder if he would have made something more overtly queer. Right. <laughs> Right. It would have been fun, but maybe he was too old to have a good opinion on that. I don't know. Because <laughs> right. I feel like he was making a lot of films about his youth, hmm. but in contemporary times. But I'm sure there's a plenty of people who are going to carry that torch for him. Yeah. The new Hamaguchi film, Wheel of Fortune and Fantasy. Be sure to check oh, it out oh, because oh. there's a, a little, <laughs> little gay stuff No, don't happening. tell me. Don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you both for going on this journey with me also thank you to all listeners thanks for giving me two deep cuts because i'm an indecisive little prick <laughs>
<laughs> hey, that's what Romare movies are all about. <laughs> exactly. That's actually very true. <laughs> I want to see a Romare film with you in it, Ben. <laughs> Yay. I would love to be in a Romare film. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of fun. And I can speak French. Eat good food. Go to the French countryside. Wee wee. Wee wee wee. I can speak French beaucoup. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Deep Cut Boku. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Deep Cut. Please rate and review because it helps us keep making the show. Be sure to subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts so you know when our next episode drops. And you can give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram at Deep Cut Pod. Join us to talk about movies on our Discord server, to which you'll find a link in the description. And thank you to Justina Yam for our beautiful artwork. I'm Wilson. I'm Ben. I'm Eli. Take care, and we're looking forward to talking about more movies with you next time.